and we're back or i'm back well sirius is back okay i'm probably confusing myself here more than you know although that's questionable as i sort of deep down know where i'm trying to get with all of this so fourth episode of c64 gaming from 1987 and there's one or two more left after this one for now though let's jump straight into it mini boot is bar none the best mini golf game on c64 and one of the better ones overall even to this day it's easy to pick up and learn, so that it can be enjoyed by practically anyone, even without any knowledge of the sport, but in the same time it's difficult to master, especially those latter more demanding holes in power. If you add to it pretty nice easily readable graphics and multiplayer with up to 4 of you competing on the same system, and 4 sets of unique courses, it makes for an incredibly enjoyable gameplay. Each course is entirely different in terms of both layout and difficulty level, and requires a bit different approach. If you like mini-golf or even just to play with others, there's hardly any better game to get yourself lost in on Commodore's 8-bit micro. Motus is a versus action game that originated in the arcades. It's basically a battle royale played with bumper cars on rectangle playfield built out of tiles. The goal is to bump off the opponents of the game board while in the same time defending yourself from being bumped too. The game can be played by two players and it's most fun that way, but even if you're alone it's actually pretty good too and can get hectic at times. When you manage to get rid of all opponents and bump them off the board, you move to the next round. If the match is taking too long, a fireball will slowly start removing tiles, making for a more demanding competition. In some rounds you can collect power-ups that will allow you to have stronger bumping powers and more importantly, ability to jump over gaps. After landing few times on a tile from a jump like that, it collapses creating another cavity in the game field. Motos is fun and if you have someone with you who also likes C64 games, it can prove one of the better titles to play together. Now, this is not going to be a game preview but a history lesson as I've just learned a terrible truth. Mass media has been telling us for years that Canadians are nothing more than incredibly nice, conflict avoiding, maple syrup drinking folk. Mass media was lying. Luckily creators of Mountie Mix Death Right did not fall for the propaganda and decided to spill the truth. And I'm here to share it all with you, so that the lies about seemingly peaceful maple syrup land can be brought to light. They are all unsung heroes that most of us don't even know of. All Canadian Mounties, and by extension of that most Canadians, as everyone knows that most Canadians are born Mounties, run on top of trains. 8 hours per day, 7 days a week, constantly, in shifts. It's basically your Pacific Rim scenario but in Canada. Why do they do that? Well, to stop the nefarious bandits invading their beautiful country by the only logical means. Roofs of the trains. Because any real criminal knows that there is no better way to smuggle yourself somewhere than that. So, our poor poor heroes every single day dress in red, put on their funky hats and get to the closest train station to defend the land. And it's not easy, as those pesky buddies usually bring weapons with them and don't hesitate to shoot at our peaceful lads. Now, they can if they want to shoot back, but if they choose to spare lives, being the good guys that they are, they resort to jumping on the enemies, dropping them off the train, and hence saving them from death, only leaving them mangled for the rest of their lives. Did I mention grenades? Well, there's obviously grenades too, because evil knows no bounds and our Canadian brothers and sisters have to face that too. I gotta tell you guys, I didn't expect to learn so much today about one nation's culture and struggle, their constant fight against onslaught of bandits invading their motherland. So, for all they have to go through on a daily basis, Mounties, I salute you. Mousetrap is an arcade single screen platformer and a game that's conceptually similar to Manic Miner. You play as a mouse, surprise surprise, and have to collect random objects. They can be anything from cheese through cakes to balloons and anything in between. Frankly, what they are is irrelevant. What's important is that all of them need to be picked up in each level for the door to the next to open. And all that within a limited time. So, you'll be jumping over flowers among others, avoid bouncing balls and various different enemies, as contact with any will cost you a life. The levels are composed out of typical for the genre platforms, ladders and ledges, and shortfalls are fine, but if you drop from great height, it'll cost you a life. Mousetrap is perhaps not the best platformer on C64, but it's fun, for an hour or so, every once in a while. Mutants is a top-down arcade shooter where you travel through 15 levels fighting off enemies and collecting 15 parts of a self-destruct system, just to assemble them at the end and destroy the Survivor Zero Corporation, the antagonist of the game, a huge conglomerate that supplies weapons to all sides of all conflicts without any scruples. Their latest creation, a microgenetic mutoid, so micromutants, are extremely dangerous microorganisms that are very aggressive and able to mutate upon need to face any and all opposition. They are in fact most likely going to devour all life in the galaxy if left to their own devices. So you, a rainbow warrior, I know it's a name you've heard before, are sent to find all those self-destruct mechanism pieces and to stop the evil company. 
Sound design and graphics are pretty good, even if not great, but number of sprites on the screen in certain levels can be pretty impressive, I must add. If you like shooters, and especially if you like Hunter's Moon mentioned in one of the earlier episodes, you like mutants as they share a lot in their design. Nebulus is an unusual action platformer, but we'll get back to it in a second. And second. Well, that was fast, so it's unusual because of how it displays its graphics. The character is in the middle of the screen, and when he moves, his sprite stays stationary in the middle, with the background rotating around it. And given the fact that the levels are the towers he walks around outside of, on the ledges, it gives the game a very pseudo-3D effect. It is probably one of the more WoW games on C64. So games that make you go WoW coming from other 8-bit platforms. Sure, Nebulus had ports to other 8-bit machines too, but I feel that it shined the most on Commodore's Little Beast. Story-wise, because of course there's a story, you're a green bipedal armless dude who has to get to top of 8 towers to blow them up, and by doing so prevent poisoning of water supplies on planets that they're on. I know, sounds stupid, but whatever, it's a platformer, it plays and looks great, so who cares. In between the towers the game switches into the side-scrolling bonus stages where you can collect bonus points. Nebulus is one of the better known C64 games, and not for no reason. And every C64 owner, regardless if they like platformers or not, should check it out to experience the aforementioned WoW effect. Cause it's even better in real life than it is on the video. Nemesis The World is a single screen action platformer based on a British comic book by the same name. If you've not read the comics, the characters and the story may seem odd, so I'll give you the gist of it. You're Nemesis, and you're the anti-hero of the game, but you're not bad per se. Torque Maida is the Grandmaster of Termite, he commands the hordes of Terminators and rules the Earth with his Tyrant Iron Fist. He's definitely the bad one. And the game will take you through 30 single screen levels filled with villains' armies that you'll need to dispose of to eventually defeat the Torque Maida himself. You're armed with a sword and a gun with limited ammo and while it may not sound like a lot, I know you. I've seen you conquer bigger evils and save universes. You'll manage. I believe in you. Interestingly enough, bodies of defeated opponents remain on the screen and some levels may require you to pile them up to be able to reach higher platforms, using them as stepping stones. A bit gruesome, but otherwise interesting mechanic. I'm not a big fan of graphics in Nemesis, I don't know why, but it feels blank and blocky in the same time, to me. But gameplay is pretty fun, so overall it's a recommendation. In Octopolis, you're the bad guy. For once I must add, cause that Mr. Goodishoes behavior of yours was starting to get old. I mean, I'm glad that you saved so many so often, but it was beginning to look suspicious. No one is that good. And now you've proved I'm right. You play as a pilot working for the Empire, helping it conquer the last planet that was not under the rule yet. And to do so, you need to capture 8 biggest cities and deactivate planet's defenses. Octopolis is part horizontally scrolling shooter and part action platformer. In fact, every level in the game is divided in these two sections. In shooter part of the game your ship is viewed from both side and top down, as you do not only move up and down but also sideways. The side movement is done by holding down the fire button. How do you shoot you may wonder? Well, the ship shoots automatically, so that's one thing that you don't need to worry about. That said, I hope it's some kind of energy projectile, as otherwise bullet number you go through will quickly send you to the cleaners. I mean, who can afford so many shots? When a certain number of enemies is destroyed, you have to maneuver your ship onto a special spot that will allow you to enter the city you fought over and start playing in the platforming section of the game, which is always divided into five screen-sized rooms in which you shoot the evil eyes for points and avoid enemies on which your weapon is ineffective. Octopolis is fun, go play it. PHM Pegasus is a combat simulation game in which you control small maneuverable attack boat, completing a variety of different missions. They can be anything from destroying enemy vessels through surveillance to escorting and supply ships through enemy territory. You obviously start the game at the lowest rank and as you progress through it completing missions successfully, you'll get promoted eventually becoming Admiral. Missions can be attempted at any order and don't follow any overarching plot. You will get to control additional units like other ships and helicopters in some of them and that's always fun, so there's a lot of variety if you're into the genre. Honestly, I only ever really cared about submarines when it came to naval simulations, so you'll have to try Pegasus out and make up your own mind about it. Platoon is based on a cult classic movie of the same title. It loosely follows the plot of it too and it's an action adventure where you take a squad of 5 soldiers through scenes taken out straight from the movie. First is side scrolling where you run through a jungle and can jump and duck to avoid various dangers. You will also engage enemy soldiers here, but your goal is to blow up a bridge and then locate village and find torch, map and a trapdoor. Next section is entirely different, as it's viewed from the first person perspective, where you move through a series of tunnels looking for flares and a compass. You will be attacked by bodies here too, but more in an Operation warf like style. After escaping tunnels you fortify yourself in a bunker for the night, using flares to locate the enemies to shoot at. 
When that's done, you have two minutes to rush into a safe position north using early found compass for directions. And finally, you face against the antagonist of the game, Sergeant Barnes. I must hit him with grenades five times to win the game. Platoon may not be the best action game on C64, but it's very varied and because of that, really fun. Point X is a vertically scrolling shooter that in its gameplay design is clearly inspired by Zebius. That said, some would argue that it's better than Commodore's port of original. The jury is still out on that, but it's pretty fun and genuinely good looking shooter nonetheless. So, you'll be fighting various unique enemies that fly in different patterns and bombing their land installations too. Some of these should bug though, so keep that in mind. Graphically, Point X is quite nice and sounds are up to par too, so if you enjoy shoot em ups, it's definitely one worth tracking down and trying out. What I don't like about it though is the difficulty curve, which is just horrendous. And the fact that upgrades are far in between and also reset at the start of each new level is just another drop. While first level may be a tad on a demanding side, the second is like a brick wall that you keep hitting with your head hoping to make a dent in. The jump in difficulty is so steep in fact that only seasoned shoot em up veterans will be able to contain the beast of this game and complete it. If you're one of them, there's hardly any better. If you're not, then probably better skip it as frustration it can create is only comparable to that caused by modern Souls-like games. Power Struggle is pitting East against West in this global military strategy that's played both in turns and in real time. I know, sounds stupid, but hear me out. You and a friend, or you and CPU, play opposing sides of the conflict, fighting for control over neutral countries to take them over and assimilate into your empire. While you fight for them, you can also attempt to take those over belonging to the opponent, so the game is as much about attack as it is about defense. Not all actions require use of military, and some countries may be taken over peacefully by a political influence or other means. While you make choices on what to do in turns, which are time limited but turns nonetheless, when you issue them and then your opponent does the same, all are executed together in real time. And that's what I meant saying that it's played in both, cause if you think about it, it is. Anyway, the game is fine when played against a friend, and not so much alone. Not saying that it's bad, just that it loses a lot of its appeal. Some would say that Project Stealth Fighter is the very best flight combat simulation on C64. Now, I am not a simulation nut, just a regular one, nut that is, so all I can tell you is that it indeed is a very good game. Is it the best? It's hard for me to judge, but it's definitely out there with the top of the top for the genre. In fact, it was awarded the Origin Award for the best military or strategy computer game of 1987. Don't know how much that means to you, but apparently at the time it was notable. The game places you in the cockpit of a Lockheed F-19 and lets you fly numerous different missions in Libya, Persian Gulf, Scandinavia and Central Europe. All these have selectable setup parameters such as rules of engagement, escalation of conflict, risk, type of targets and skill level of fighting and landing. That degree of control made the game practically infinitely playable as each mission could be set up entirely different than any other. If you like simulations, don't sleep on this one. Quadex aka Mindroll is a puzzle game consisting of 10 different levels that can be played in any order, in which you control a silver ball with which you need to locate an exit square in each of the levels. It is easier said than done, however, as each of the levels apart from the first introductory one is a maze and a challenge of its own, requiring you to use teleports, conveyor belts, jump and locate keys needed to open areas that are initially inaccessible. All that in a very limited time that often feels like most challenging factor itself, let alone all the obstacles and puzzles. Quedex is fun even if a bit demanding and treat to those who enjoy environmental puzzle games. Graphics, while having a very simple subject to portray, are pretty nice and sounds are good too. Music is only ever present in two stages, which is a no choice, but it is what it is, I suppose. Personally, I like Quedex, whether you will is up to you. There are two versions of Rampage on C64. This, European, released in 1987 and US1 released two years later. Both are based on an arcade game of the same title, but which is better is up to you, as they both have their own strengths and weaknesses. The protagonists of the game are George, Lizzie and Ralph, so a giant gorilla, lizard and werewolf respectively, and they have to destroy the buildings in different cities by damaging them to the point that they would collapse. You do so by smashing sidewalls on all floors from both sides, and when they are all damaged, the building is destroyed. It's not all rainbow and roses, however, and the cities are being actively defended by both police and military. They send hundreds upon hundreds of units against you in the form of tanks, copters and shooters, and while they're all mostly harmless on their own, the sheer amount makes a difference and they can be an issue if left unattended. While Rampage is quite fun, even if that repeatable when played alone, it gets much better with a friend, and that's how it should be experienced. Period. Rapid Fire is an arcade side-scrolling shooter, and it's all about fast action and pure fun. There's some kind of a backstory of you being an undercover cop who must destroy a warehouse filled with armed bank robbers, but if I'm to be honest the plot is irrelevant, you won't think about it at all, it will not stop you in your tracks and you'll keep on doing what you do best, so causing mayhem and destruction in all levels. 
Enemies come from both sides at ground and roof level and there's seemingly unlimited numbers of them, as if the building itself was spawning them into existence from another dimension. This is, however, also entirely unimportant because you're not there to ponder about their origin, but conversely, to put an end to their existence. While you do that though, keep an eye on your machine gun, as if it's in constant use it may overheat and require a moment to cool down. Moment that may be the difference between your life and death. Neither graphics nor sounds are of very high quality, but same as with the plot, they are drowned quickly in a sea of frantic action and you don't really get to wonder about them too much, spewing thousands of bullets all around. Rapid Fire is not the best run and gun on C64, but it's definitely one of the better fun because it's simple games and looks eerily similar to little known arcade game called Special Forces. It's not the same, but similarities are uncanny. Rebounder is a sequel to Aerial Bounder and equally is good even if a bit different game. It's a true sequel, meaning that it kept what worked from original's formula and expanded and changed bits and pieces here and there to provide novelty and variety without changing the mechanics too much. The aim of the game is to collect 16 smart bombs to use them against the evil overlord. Same as in original, you'll face many of his minions along the way but can shoot them with your gun and at the end of each level face a stronger enemy in the form of a sentinel. There's quite a few weapons to pick up, which is not something you'd expect from a bouncing ball game, and they shoot different projectiles. There are also 9 different distinctive enemies, each with their own capabilities and numerous environmental obstacles to contend with. Same as in Bounder, Rebounder did not forget about slabs, and they can offer you extra points, larger bounds and mysterious unknown bonuses, both good and bad. This time, however, you can pick, if you'd like, the playfield to scroll horizontally or vertically, which, while unnecessary, is a nice quality of life addition. Graphics and sound-wise, Rebounder looks great, same as its predecessor did, and gameplay is as addicting too. So, if you like arcade games with some puzzle elements that are just that little bit different than anything else, Rebounder is a game for you. Vermeer is my most favorite business management and trading game of 1980s. It came out on C64, Amstrad CPC, Atari ST, Amiga and DOS, and it is equally brilliant and near identically playing on all of the machines. In short, you left with a bit of cash and a target of recovering stolen arts by Vico Vermeer. And since paintings are expensive, so you'll have to multiply your money. So you'll be building plantations, investing in stocks and trading various pieces of art. And quite honestly, the game is better if you ignore the fact that you're supposed to do something to end it. It's best played as an open-ended business simulation. And the fact that up to four players can compete simultaneously makes it even better. If you'd like to know more, I have a separate video review on it on my channel. And I'll link it in the top right and in the description below. It's Amiga's version review, but they're all virtually the same. Oh, and the game is in German only. I don't speak or read German, but I've played it so many times that I understand everything in it. And believe me, it's so good that it's worth just giving it that little time to get used to, to the controls being in it, even if you don't speak the language. A true arcade classic that has seen ports to most, if not all, 8 and 16-bit systems and is probably overshadowed in this number only by Skyrim, that to my knowledge can run on anything from calculators through fridges to out-of-date tomato soup cans alike. In fact, if anything runs on power or electricity, or imagination for that matter, chances are it can also run a port of Skyrim in some form or fashion, regardless if it even should. C64's Bubble Bobble is an amazing conversion true to the arcade, running beautifully even on this very basic system. It may not shock with colorful graphics, it has no parallax scrolling whatsoever, multiple gameplay planes or even high quality sound, but that tune, that tune man, that main tune is so darn good that regardless how much you try, you'll have a tough time forgetting it. It will haunt you in your sleep and awake. Forever. And you will not hear it in this video because of copyright strikes. What's most important though is that C64's conversion kept the addictive gameplay of the original and nothing was lost in translation. If you love the arcade game, you'll love it on Commodore's machine. I have no doubt about that. Maniac Mansion is the first ever modern point-and-click adventure game released by LucasArts, and first to use SCAM engine. SCAM was acronym for Script Creation Utility for Maniac Mansion, but as history has proven, it was used in different iterations for basically all following adventure titles by LucasArts, and sparked general movement in the industry of dropping old text-based parsers in favor of more user-friendly and intuitive point-and-click system. System that the whole genre got its name from. The Maniac Mansion is a game designed by Ron Gilbert and Gary Winnick, who wanted to tell a comedic story that would be heavily based on B-horror movies. The game follows Dave Miller, who with a couple of friends sets on saving his girlfriend Sandy, who was kidnapped and held locked by a mad scientist Dr. Fred. Other than the omnipresent humor and click interface, main notable novelty of the game was its design. When starting the game, player is asked to pick two out of the six available characters that will join Dave in saving Sandy. Each of them has a completely unique set of skills and personality, and any combination can be used to complete the game. 
but since some puzzles can only be solved by certain characters, different sets of puzzles are required on each playthrough, when different characters are chosen. Maniac Mansion is one of the most important games in history and should be experienced by any true gamer at least once. It was the fourth video proving that 1987 was the best year for C64. There's tomorrow I think for the year that I have lined up and believe me, it doesn't look like the games in those will be any worse. What do you think? Am I right or am I right? Because I can't possibly be wrong, can I? Let me know in the comments below. Also make sure to subscribe not to miss the release of the next video. 70% of you are not subscribed, so you may never be sure if YouTube decides to send the video your way when it's released. Even better, if you hit the bell, new videos will not only land in your subs box, but you also get short and friendly notification when they're there. So think about it. If you'd like to support the channel grow, I'd appreciate both Patreon and YouTube memberships. All the help I get allows me to release better content, and I currently slowly work towards replacing my editing PC. Members get access to my new videos a day early and are always in the loop on what I plan to release, change, introduce, etc. But if you can't or don't want to do that, likes and subscribes are great too. Most of all, however, I would like to thank all the YouTube Let's Play and Playthrough creators from whose videos short bits were taken for this one as a video background to my commentary. You'll find all their names linking to their channels in the description below. They're amazing and thanks to their efforts, retro community can prevail for years longer and in better form than it could have otherwise. So thank you. For me though, this is all, so have a good one and I'll see you next time. Peace.